Welcome, folks. This is House Corrections and Institutions Committee. It is Thursday, March 24th. We are going to be working on a bill, Senate bill, that's been sent to our committee, S-173, which deals with uh, the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House and um, sort of reconfigures that and also talks about the um, position of the state curator. So we have with us Rebecca Becky Wasserman, our legal counsel, that will give us a walkthrough of the bill first, and then we'll go to our Sergeant at Arms and our, and our curator. So Becky, welcome. Good morning. <clears throat> Becky Wasserman, Legislative Counsel. Um, so this is, I'm gonna uh, walk through S-173. Uh, which passed out of the Senate and um, has been renamed an act relating to the State House art collections. Uh, so, in general, um, what this bill is doing is making um, various changes relating to the oversight of the State House art collections. So, uh, first, it is making some changes in statute to the legislative membership of the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House. Um, by decreasing um, the House and Senate members and adding a state curator. It's also changing some of the, the role of the committee from being more of an oversight role um, rather than just an advisory role um, with respect to the uh, approval of the State House Collections Policy. And then it also makes some changes in statute to the duties of the Sergeant at Arms and the state curator with respect to the State House Art Collection. Um, so I can just start um, in section one of the bill, <clears throat> which uh, is the section that addresses the uh, Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House. So um, in subsection B, you'll see that the membership um, reduces the number of House and Senate members to three each, which uh, it was pre previously four. And it subdivision seven adds a state curator. Um, last, I believe it was last year or two years ago, um, the General Assembly actually added those two legislative members. So this is decreasing it back down to what it previously was. Um, sorry, was there a question? I wasn't sure if I, no, okay. No. Um, on page uh, two of the bill, Sorry, on, on page one of the bill, it's also in subdivision six um, for the Commissioner of Buildings and General Services. Uh, that, that member on the committee is also allowing that this is um, can be represented by a de designee and not just the commissioner. Page two um, makes some change. Make some changes to the um, requirements for the committee meetings. So first, um, it says that when the General Assembly is not in session, the committee um, shall meet at least one time. But the total number of times that the committee and any subcommittees can meet is capped at six times per year, unless there's um, some approval of the speaker and the pro tem to meet more than that. Um, there, the language um, on in subsection D also strikes out the reference to meetings being at the state house. Um, so there's no longer a requirement that when the committee meets, it has to be at the state house. Uh, page three of the bill <clears throat> is amending the functions of the legislative advisory committee on the state house. Um, so, the committee is authorized to oversee all activities related to state house collections. Uh, previously, this was referred to acquisitions, but it has been um, sort of a, a new referral to collections, which my understanding is a broader um, representation that acquisitions are part of the collections. And um, the committee is also overseeing uh, the care of paintings and historic artifacts and furnishings. Um, this all used to be a, a consultation role, 
but the committee is still maintaining its consultation role with respect to the building and its interior uh, refurbishing, renovation, pre preservation, and expansion of the building and its interior. So we have a question, Becky. Uh, Kurt? Um, is, is oversee a term of art? Do we know the difference between oversee and consult? What that actually, what does that mean in practicality? Um, well, the, <clears throat> I mean, I think that they have more of a, a decision-making role in, in those aspects of the state house art collection. Whereas consultation, I think the idea here is that um, they would be consulted. Somebody else has that duty and they are consulted on how it is um, implemented. I guess I'm, I'm guess that's what I'm asking is who has the final say? If there's disagreement, does the committee have the final say or does the other people involved? Um, for the collections, the I think we'll get to this later on with respect to the duties of the state curator and the the sergeant at arms. Um, so okay. the, this, the state curator collections policy, um, on page, wait till then. page six, let's, let's, um, sorry, go ahead. He can wait. Well, let's, let's wait oh, okay. Sure. <laughs> so in terms of, um, subdivision two, and I think this goes to this, this question as well, that the committee is now give, rather than developing a plan for the collections uh, or commission of artwork, it is approving a plan that plan um, for commission, collection or commissions of artwork for the state house collection. Um, and this language was added a couple of years ago that it has to represent Vermont's diverse people and history, including diversity of gender, race, ethnicity, sexuality, and disability status. We have some questions, Becky. Sarah and then Karen. So Becky, you, you may or may not know the answer to this. I'm just curious about where this came from because a committee, it sounds like, well, maybe it'll be revealed later, but what was the thinking behind a, a committee who doesn't have his necessarily credentials in history, curatorial expertise or, what was the was there discussion about that in that committee in the Senate or um because it seems it just seems to me like this there's a big role with the state house advisory committee there's one piece of it that we're talking about we're going to be looking at a potentially big construction project and a certain kind of expertise and then there's this is about a committee that's looking at the 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 collection <laughs> and it's now basically able to override the responsibilities of the state curator is what it sounds like. It, I mean, it, it's gone from advisory to not being advisory. Well, I think there, um, so I, I can't really speak to the intent of the Senate on this, but um, so the advisory committee does have the state curator on it now. Um, so the state curator does provide that expertise uh, to the committee. Um, and I think, the, yeah, I think the statutory roles of the state curator and the sergeant at arms have been, uh, sort of refined and more focused on what they are both responsible for and the role of the legislative advisory committee, I see as oversight just with respect to, um, this collections policy and approving it um, and giving the legislature, uh, I guess, a, a, a voice in that, in that um, collections policy, but with respect to the other uh, duties of the Sergeant at Arms and the State Curator, I actually think those two roles are more defined in this bill and it's clear what they are responsible for. Okay, I'm sure we'll have more discussion. Karen? Yes, and I don't know if this is further in, I couldn't see it, but is there a timeline of when this plan for the collections needs to be done? 
Bye. Um, so <clears throat> that was, I'm just pulling it up in at the 2020 Capitol bill. The, there was a direction for the legislative advisory committee to consult with the state curator to develop a plan for the acquisition or commission of artwork for the state house collection. And a report was due in 2021 on this. Uh, so I think this goes to the chair's question earlier of whether someone was working on this. The, I mean, the there was language requiring it. I don't know what the status of this is now. And I, I think perhaps the this language, this change, it this statutory change right now is trying to address moving that project along. So Becky, in the Capitol bill in 2020, was that the advisory committee that would be doing that plan and not another committee? Um, yes, so it was the, just pulling up the language, the uh, legislative advisory committee on the state house in consultation with the state curator shall develop a plan for the acquisition or commission of artwork for the state house collection that incorporates the intent and policies that were laid out um, and that dealt with the sort of diversity of the state house art collection. And the committee, the legislative advisory committee would consult with the public and relevant experts um, to research and recommend um, you know, historical leadership stories that would be included in the state house art collection the report was due on or before March 1st, 2021, and that was to be submitted to your committee and the Senate Committee on Institutions with the plan and recommendations for any rec uh, legislative action. So that never happened. It's my understanding that that didn't happen. I think that, and I, you know, I wasn't part of it, but I, I think that people were, were and perhaps are working on it, but it, a, a report to my knowledge was never submitted to your committee. There's a timeline for the report. And then I was also wondering a timeline of when the committee would approve the report. So there might be some room in there to add some more clarity. Yes, and I think that the language on the report from two years ago, um, I think this new language doesn't contemplate the committee approving the report. So to the extent that a report is now being worked on and will follow what was required two years ago, I think it would have to go through an approval process, um, whereas before it didn't, if, if this bill is enacted. Okay. Keep going, Becky. Um, so in, let me turn back, on page uh, three of the bill, subsection B, the language um, that says that the committee's recommendations shall be advisory only is struck out, and that is um, because there is uh, some aspects of the committee's work that is not just advisory. Uh, so. Uh, that language is uh, moot. <laughs> um, subsection C of the bill authorizes uh, the committee to um, establish subcommittees as needed, both permanent and ad hoc, and requires that a collection subcommittee specifically um, shall, in coordination with experts, develop a collections policy for recommendation for the committee. So I think the intended process here is that this subcommittee is coming up with the collections policy that is required to be approved by the, the committee as a whole. And then this is what the state curator will be adopting. So this only deals with the selection policy in terms of the art pieces itself. Correct. The collections policy. Um, I 
I'm, I think maybe the, the, the state, yeah, the, the curator could speak to this more. I think collections is sort of like a broader term that can include acquisitions and commissioning of work um, and other things. So it ha it's like a, I mean, I guess this is a pun, but it's a term of art <laughs> that, um, that several things would be included in that collections policy. And would this collections policy uh, make clear where the dollars are coming from to purchase the art? There's got to be some financial uh, interest here somewhere because not all the art's going to be donated okay. or maybe not all the art will be paid for by other entities. What about the acquisition and maintenance of the art. <clears throat> Is that um, there's nothing in the language that specifies that. Um, I, I, my understanding is that the current acquisitions policy or policy or, or way that artwork is acquired now or commissioned um, might have some um, procedure for sort of accepting artwork. So. It, it's possible that this would too, but it's definitely not specified in the law. <clears throat> okay. Okay, let's keep going. Jeffrey. Okay, so page four, subsection D is um, requiring that the Sergeant at Arms, the state curator, the president of the Friends of the Vermont State House and the chair of the Joint Legislative Management Committee execute an MOU to coordinate the policies, oversight, and care of the State House artwork collection. Okay, um, then we can move on to section two if there are no questions there. And section two is amending the duties of the Sergeant at Arms. So um, subdivision six um, is uh, limiting the Sergeant at Arms uh, responsibilities to maintaining the state house and its furnishings in good repair um, and requiring a consultation with the state curator. <clears throat> and the language on uh, providing security is moved to a different subdivision on the next page, uh, top of page five. So the Sergeant at Arms will provide security for the State House pursuant to um, the duties of that, of the Sergeant at Arms. Um, so this is sort of moved and it's just technical to clarify the current responsibilities, but what it's doing is um, removing um, the, some language that might be in conflict with the state curator, curator's responsibilities for the furnishings and other um, items in the state house, like draperies, rugs, desks. So this has always been an issue <clears throat> between who has jurisdiction over uh, the <clears throat> furnishings in the state house. Uh, the drapes, the rugs, the desks. Is it, is it the sergeant at arms? Is it the curator? BGS gets involved sometimes. The curator is under the commissioner of BGS. Um, so there's been in the past some conflicts over this. Um, so this is an attempt to really clarify those roles um, between the legislative and executive branch, because with the curator being under the um, commissioner of BGS, the curator in a way is part of the executive branch. Um, sometimes there's conflict and then to stay within the historical aspect of the building, which is what the curator's role is, may come into conflict with sometimes what we need furnishings or to do our work. 
for that. So whenever there's any renovations, like when we renovated these rooms, yes, we can do some furnishings like our desks and chairs that may not that are not historical, historically correct. But when you're looking at the color of the rooms or the carpeting or that type of thing, you really want, or the lighting, you want to bring back the historic aspect of the building. So that's where the curator gets involved, BTS gets involved, and the Sergeant Arms gets involved. So this is clarifying those roles, or it's an attempt to clarify those roles. Okay. So, okay. so <clears throat> subsection C on page five is also clarifying um, one of the Sergeant at Arms responsibilities um, with respect to um, clarifying that the Sergeant at Arms is not responsible for uh, structural repairs, capital improvements, or for maintenance or curating historic state house, the historic state house and its collections. Um, so this is adding in the, the curating um, aspect to the state house and the collections aspect, which is clarified in the next section with respect to this, the state curator's responsibilities. Okay. We have a question, Becky. Um, yeah, sorry, my question actually goes back to uh, B. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just wondering where it says um, it's about accepting gifts. I'm wondering, like, I think about the, the pages or the people that work downstairs with the Sergeant of Arms. And like, I know, for example, a member of our committee is very generous and always brings a box of donuts to each of the groups of pages. Would that technically be violating that because you're accepting a gift or would there be an exception for like consumable foods or something like that? Um, so this is, yeah, this is current law. Um, I usually the gift uh, policy. Actually, I you know I don't want to speak out of turn on this. I, I think that the a de minimis gift is probably fine, like a donut or a piece of candy. But um, I, I also I also think that there might be um, a specific policy on this. So I don't I want to see what there is, and I can pull that up and get back to you. Okay, I would just like to know because, like, someday I might want to bring in cookies or something, and I don't want to be doing I something that's not allowed. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. All right, it just—it's not clear. I was, so. going to, I was going to say the federal government. We had guidelines. You could accept gifts that were up to X number of dollars or donations, but not to exceed. And there were—I'm sure we got something to the state we're, that's got to say the same. Yeah, and and generally for the executive branch, there is a um, a gift. There's a statutory section in 32 VSA section five um, about acceptance of gifts to the state and uh, gifts under a certain monetary threshold don't have to go through that acceptance policy. Um, so I guess I'm assuming that there's something similar for the Sergeant at Arms. I just, I don't know what it is. So I don't wanna um, guess at what that threshold would be, but um, generally speaking, uh, something like a piece of candy it was would probably be fine. Okay, it just, it's worded very clear, not accept any compensation, but if there's a little wiggle room in that in terms of small edibles, then that's good. <laughs> Thank you. I, probably depends on the type of edibles oh, you're giving. Poor choice of words, poor choice of words. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Gummy bears, you're gonna give them gummy bears. <laughs> that is not what I meant. Oh, sure. good grief. Gummy bears, gummy bears. All right, let's go on to the next topic. <laughs> okay, Becky. Okay, um, section three uh, is amending the state curator's responsibilities. <clears throat> so uh, top of page six, the state curator um, is responsible for oversight of the historical integrity of the state house and its collections of art, decorative arts and furnishings. Um, so this is, um, so this, the Sergeant at Arms um, did have a reference in, um, in, or currently has a reference in statute to 
um, maintaining the state house and its furnishings in good state of repair. And this is uh, the sort of clarifying that with respect to furnishings, the state curator is overseeing the um, sort of historical integrity aspect of those furnishings and collections of art, which is different than what the Sergeant at Arms is doing. Um, in, with respect to um, visiting public, so the interpretation of the State House to the visiting public through exhibits, publication, tours, and other means of communication. There is no change to the uh, the responsibility with respect to the acquisition management of and care of state house collections of art, but a new responsibility was added in subdivision four for oversight and management of the state's historic and contemporary art and collections in state buildings and on state property. And I think this is acknowledging the state curator's role, um, not just in the state house, but in other state buildings and state property. Subsection C is um, changing the reference uh, of acquisitions policy to collections policy and is uh, saying that um, in accordance with the plan and uh, upon approval of the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House, the state curator shall adopt a collections policy. So going back to section one, the subcommittee the collection subcommittee will develop the collections policy. The committee at, on, as a whole will approve that policy and then the state curator would adopt the policy. Becky, I have a question, but it's up on number four. So the curator is gonna have oversight and management of the art collections in our state buildings and on our state property. So when we uh, put in a piece that is through our art and state buildings, you know, we could have a, st a statue in front of a building like at the Waterbury Complex or the Secure Residential, or we've got some art pieces that are within some of our state office buildings. It is now the curator that would have responsibility of maintaining those. Um. Yes, and I think that perhaps the curator currently uh, does this already, but it just was never specified in statute that that was the role of the state curator. But this, this language is explicitly um, delegating that responsibility to the state curator. So I can start seeing a line item in somebody's budget of dollars to start maintaining those pieces of art that we've been purchasing and installing over the years that the art and state buildings process has been in place. Because some of that, some of those uh, art purchases have been probably 25, 30 years old and are now uh, needing some care. So I can start seeing a line item somewhere in somebody's budget for this. You know, just putting that out so people are aware. Karen and then Sarah. Um, so this is going back a little bit, but as we're going through this, it sounds like one of the um, reasonings for this to this bill to come to be is to look at the diversity of the collections and uh, through the lens of the history and celebrating diversity. Um, and so I guess this goes back to page three of this um, under functions of the committee and it's the bottom of the page on two. Um, but it's just, I'm realizing this is a theme that's coming up on this, where it says um, that the policy shall be developed um, in coordination with experts. Was there any, like experts, experts in what area? Is it experts in diversity, experts in art, in history, whatever it is, or is it up for interpretation? Uh, because it doesn't specify, I think it's broad enough to include 
any of those options. Um, if you wanted it to, to include specific types of experts, you can make that explicit in the language. Okay. That, I guess that's something that I would like for us to have more conversation about. If there is a piece of like, we're trying to get this collection to be more di celebrating diversity and with the history of Vermont, that we might want to add more detail in there. Um, to, to add to that, um, the language about developing the collections policy from two years ago does um, specify the type of experts. So, um, and, and that was uh, session law for, for specifically developing this policy, but it does include um, Vermont historians, artists, and diverse community leaders. And right, the public. It's not referenced in this, right? Like there's no connection of referencing that in this bill. No, because this is just the statutory language giving the responsibility for the collections policy to be um, approved by the advisory committee. The other language was the direction to come up with a more diverse collections policy, and it had more detail on what should be included in that policy. Okay. So this goes in the green books. The other language did not, number one. So whenever you put anything in the green books, it's law. And sometimes when you list things, it in essence is more limiting. And sometimes you use broader language because you know it's gonna change over time or you can include more folks. So that's that's something that the legislature, a legislative committee always grapples with. Do you list it or do you put in broad language? So we can flag that. Because once you put something in, in law, it's a little different than session law. It's there. And then if you want to change it, it's much more cumbersome. So Sarah. My question can wait. So Becky, can you go over and um, see on page six what the process was and, and who has what responsibility? You did that, but I was still thinking on number four. Remember sure. So, so on page um, page three. Um, you'll see that the collection subcommittee of the committee, um, in coordination with those experts, would develop a collections policy that they recommend to the committee as a whole. The committee as a whole is responsible for approving a plan for that plan for the collections policy. And then the state curator on page, um, where is that? Page six. Uh, adopts that uh, that policy upon approval of the committee. So the advisory committee approves the policy, and then from there, the curator then adopts it. And then it is the curator that then carries out that policy. Is that true? Yes. Yeah, yeah. So the curator has responsibility for the oversight of the, the collections of art and decorative arts and furnishings. So the, uh, the curator is essentially implementing the collections policy. So there's no broad legislative input. It's just a handful of legislators, six legislators speaking for the whole body and the whole building. Is that correct? There, there's no group of legislators speaking for the whole body? There's, there's no, the General Assembly as a whole doesn't weigh into it, is what I'm saying. You've got six legislators total that are making the decisions for the whole building and on That's, behalf of the whole legislature. Yeah, well, correct, with respect to the collections policy. And then there's also the 
MOU, which has the chair of the Joint Legislative Management Committee. So the legislature does have a role with uh, respect to that as well. But not the legislature as a whole, the chair of that committee is, you know, the representative of the legislature. And then this would take effect in July of this year. Yes, that was uh, the last section um, is the effective date. Somebody's busy. <laughs> All right, my son is playing with trucks right outside the door here. So. <laughs> That's fine. Making it real. That's fine. Questions? Oh, Becky. Well, everybody's so enthused. I know, we will. No, that's where my questions are for the other folks. I think Becky's done a great job in walking us through the language. I guess I have one question on the language, which somebody mentioned already. Back, back on page three, uh, section A2, I'm just tripping up on that, on the, the flow of that sentence. The committee shall approve a plan for the collection or commission of artwork. And it, it just doesn't sound right. Um, and I think I know what's meant, but it, 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 doesn't, it doesn't seem to flow. Um, a, a plan for the collections and for the commission of artwork or including the commission of artwork? I don't know. Some... You're wordsmithing. It's wordsmithing. Well, right? that's what we're talking about, right? Right. Okay. Which line are no. we? Which? That's line two. Uh, number two. Number two. Number two. Section two. Oh, this is line. <laughs> okay. So the world does that does that trip up anybody else or am I just it is a little you? funky. So the role of the advice when you say the committee here, Becky, you are referring to the advisory committee, correct? Or the subcommittee. It's the advisory this is, committee. This is the advisory committee as a whole. Okay. And the advisory committee needs to approve a plan for the collection of the art pieces as well, or the commissioning of the art pieces. That's the intent of that sentence, correct? Or commission of new artwork. It doesn't have to be new. Well, but I mean, new to the state house. Right? Yes, and, it, and maybe the state, the curator should um, weigh in on this, but I, it's also possible that the commission of artwork would be part of the collections policy so maybe it's not necessary to refer to the commission of artwork so let's flag this for wordsmithing okay. any other questions for becky okay thank you becky Oops, you're still. You okay, Kurt? Yeah, I'm all right. Okay. <clears throat> so, which one of you folks, Sergeant at Arms or the curator, which one do you want to both come out? Yes, yes, I think it's kind of a tandem thing okay. that we worked on this mm -hmm. together. Right? Yeah, yeah. Sure. They you might have David, to give away your chair. Nope. David has more invested things to say. That is it okay to say? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Madam Chair, Sergeant at Arms, and I think that this all sits well with me. Uh, David and I have been working well together, and we were looking forward. We were looking towards the future because David's getting old. <laughs> like the rest of us. <laughs> so we I think that both for our both of ourselves feel like it was really necessary to do that. And I'll just uh co tell one more thing that Madam Chair was saying in years ago, just a simple example of the Senate chamber and the beautiful chandelier that hangs there now, a sergeant in arms. At that point, he took it upon himself to remove it because it was too much to dust, <laughs> and it ended up down in a garage on Baldwin Street. So that sounds 
crazy, but it could still happen today. So that's what we're trying to avoid. And from my perspective, all the changes that Becky had talked about, I think um, I'm comfortable with. Um, so Dana, what you're talking about are the duties of the sergeant at arms and the duties of the curator in terms of how they interact here in the building. Correct. Correct. In, in fact, in simple terms, the inside of the state house has always been under the authority of the sergeant at arms, who is an officer of the legislative branch. The exterior of the state house has always been under the jurisdiction of the Department of Buildings and General Services, which is an executive branch function. And when my job was first created nearly 40 years ago, yes, I go back as far as Alice. <laughs> um, we're old. <laughs> we're old. Um, this, nobody really envisioned my job evolving, I would say, into what it has become and has, in fact, in a de facto way, always been um certain a certain way but um only because i've kind of ignored statute for many of my years because i had to so i think what janet is referring to is the collaborative nature of the two of us together is allowing this to finally be rectified the way it ought to be in other words, not having the sergeant at arms in charge of everything and the state curator essentially serving within the building in a subordinate position, but sharing that authority in the way that it should have been from the outset, but nobody had the, you know, nobody had a plan yet. And it took a lot of years to understand how a complex building like the State House should be managed by both branches of the legislative and the uh, um, executive branches. So when my job was uh, first um, created, it was within the department in part because they wanted actually my job to have responsibility for all state buildings that were historic, not just the state house. But in reality, over the last 40 years, it has been <laughs> principally the state house because back then it wasn't as recognized as a bona fide museum. Um, hiring a curator was a brand new thing, you know, not knowing quite what it means for the state house to be seen as a museum. Today, we've, we're way past that. I think nobody questions that really anymore, which is wonderful, so that we can actually move on to the challenges of creating policies that make a lot of sense for this building, if in fact it is a museum and should be managed as such. And the, uh, you know, I've had to work with quite a long list of sergeants at arms over the years. Some of them have acknowledged that role, others have not. So happily, we're at a moment when I have this amazingly collaborative <laughs> sergeant at arms here, who is actually willing in statute to release a little bit, just a little bit of her authority within the building so that there's a more comfortable fit between the state curator uh, overseeing the historic integrity of the building and its collections and her rightful uh, role, which is everything else, which is a lot. Um, particularly beefing up, I, I will say that this bill actually addresses Janet's uh, job description of, by actually making it clearer that the, if you can imagine this, the old language, in, in my opinion, did not really make it all that clear that the Sergeant at Arms was in charge of security for the building, if you can imagine. 
they have thrown the word security into a list of unrelated uh, tasks. And now there's new language that specifically addresses that in her uh, description, if you notice. So it, furthermore, until Chris Cole came to this committee only, what, probably five years ago, I wasn't in the statute at all. So the language that is currently in the statute was something that this committee worked with Chris Cole to ensure. But the one thing that didn't happen at that time was addressing this issue. Who has the authority within the state house in terms of its historic collections and its integrity? That was not rectified, but this bill does that. And I think that is by far the most important part of this bill. Why um, the authors of the original bill that was submitted in the Senate were amazingly um, responsive to our desire to address that when the original bill actually did not. And so this is a very different bill than what they started with in the Senate, but it goes, it, it's because frankly, the authors listened to Janet and me as we talked about what really needed fixing as um, particularly I uh, envision an end date for my tenure here at the State House. It isn't gonna change the way I function, frankly, um, but it will uh, certainly set up a much better scenario for the second mm -hmm. curator which um, I've at times not been sure that there necessarily would be a second curator. Mm -hmm. So that, that really is so super important and something that I'm very grateful to uh, the authors of the bill, but also to these committees, your committee, the thoughtful questions that I was just listening to tell me how far this building has evolved and the occupants of it and your recognition of what the state house is, this complex entity that is your workplace, um, but also uh, a museum. <coughs> and um, it's really gratifying to be there and hearing your engagement with these very important questions. So thank you for that. Hey, David, can I just tell yeah. on to uh, what? Oh, so, yeah, hang on, Mary. We'll let Janet finish and then we've got some questions. So I just wanted to add this that in section nine of the Sergeant at Arms, it does says perform such duties for the benefit of the legislators as may be required by any duty authorized committee thereof. So things will come up. So it's not, it is still giving the legislature a, a voice of what is happening here in the state house, but the broad language would be like, say you wanted the single use bathroom that we just put in and the BGS wasn't able to help entirely with that. It was a coordinated effort with BGS and the Sergeant at Arms to do what the legislature wanted us to do. So there, there is that avenue, but just wanted to add that. So we have some questions, Karen sure. and then Mary. Um, thank you for explaining kind of the background and how sure. the relationship between the different um, positions and stuff has evolved. And um, I always appreciate when folks kind of think ahead of being like, how do we maintain this, even if the people, the actual people aren't there, because we want the system to work. Mm -hmm. um, so in reading this, looking this over again, it seems like the MOU part is really key yeah. then, um, because that's what's going to um create the path of like, this is how we're gonna work together going forward, even if it's not these specific people. And so I guess mm -hmm. I'm looking at that, like, does that give the language that's there? Do you feel like that gives enough? Should there be more detail? Um, that's where I'm, because I hear what Madam Chair was saying earlier too, like we don't wanna be so prescriptive, but I am also hearing that we wanna make mm -hmm. sure there's enough framework there that if two brand new people are in this position, like they have the yep. guidance. You're, you're right. The exercise of writing an MOU is really does rely very substantially on the parties that are involved and what they're willing to agree to in terms of identifying the touch points 
where each of them has a responsibility and where does their responsibility end and somebody else's begins. And that can definitely be tense if the parties are not as collaborative. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if it wasn't for Janet, quite frankly, I would be a little more nervous about that process. But she, in our working toward the outcome of this bill, I, uh, I'm completely confident that all of the parties named there are gonna be able to agree very easily on where those, where those lines should be drawn and identify that in the MOU so that it's clear to the people that follow. You're totally right. It's really about the next people in our jobs and making that clear for them. Uh, and that that's why that's such a, a critical part of this bill, I think. But MOUs, you know, are only as good as the people that are invested in creating them. So they hold you to something, but it's not the whole the whole thing. And when do you think you would be able to create it? Like if this passed, like did you have an MOU, you know, this year at some point or I, I think so. I think so. I don't think it would be difficult at all. Yeah. Uh, Mary and then Sarah. Yes, David, I just wanted to take this opportunity to thank you. Uh, I have witnessed firsthand in my 26 years of serving in the legislature your eye for detail, your amazing hard work, and your dedication to preserving the historic integrity of this amazing historic building, the State House. So I can only thank you, and I hope this process or this bill will help. As you've always done, you've worked wonderfully with your partners in this, um, but thank you for the amazing job you do. Thank you, Mary. <laughs> great. Thank you, Mary. That's uh, Sarah. That's great. It's, I, I appreciate the uh, Mary's comments too. And, and as a newer legislator, it's, it's I've appreciated how the evolution has come into being in the care that both um, the Sergeant Arms and the curator gives to this building. And one of the, I think you heard with my questions when we were walking through the language with the, with our legislative council, mm -hmm. you know, I think I come from this having worked in museums and understanding collections policies and sometimes they can be charged and their questions about like how does an institution collect you know there's all people give gifts sometimes you don't always want the gift <laughs> so it's just like you know it's like uh, um but also so I think this is this is great and also then um you know we talk about how we diversify the collection and I think it could be helpful for this committee to understand I mean I you know there are questions that come oh is there is this going to be something that comes up in our budget? But my understanding is that the, the friends of the state house is a plays an important role in this. And I think it could be, I I know a little bit about that, but it might mm -hmm. be helpful to sure. kind of clarify that. And then I also know separately, it seemed like somebody asked about state and art buildings. And there's a whole program that the Vermont Arts Council also plays there. And I know you play a role there. So and they're part of this group. But maybe I think. You know the, the the idea of collections and how we do this. I, I think it's so important as we're we're really a history museum and a cultural museum that you know the what's on our walls um, can change and evolve and doesn't mean usurping or doing away with past history as you've come in and told us. I mean as you're talking right, about right. this plan, but I think one of the questions is about like how do we pay for this? And at the state house we have a tradition of. Um, expecting donations or people to do things for free sometimes. So, <laughs> so I, I, I'd love to hear, I think we could sure. for the committee to better understand the role of the friends. No, I, I recall that actually a few weeks ago when I came in to talk to, about the Capitol bill, um, I was, uh, I gave you a little bio, I think, uh, just because, frankly, I'm in such a reflective mode these days. Um, the pandemic, you know, maybe you're there too. Um, an opportunity for a lot of reflection and an opportunity to not just reflect on um, the things I've always reflected on, but for a change, thinking about my own life. 
for example. And I started here 42 years ago as a research assistant on a project that was funded by the National Endowment for the Arts and the Vermont Arts Council, which by the way, in section six, on um, page one, the director of the Vermont Council on the Arts should probably finally be changed since 20 years ago, they changed their name <laughs> to Vermont Arts Council. So we should make that change finally to the statute. <laughs> anyway, um, the Arts Council sponsored this because they saw that the State House was a museum. And yet there was no management of it for the many people who back then were still visiting, nevertheless. Um, and that's how I started. Um, but I won't name him, but an intransigent sergeant arm <laughs> uh, stood in the way of a bill that was introduced by the chair of this committee who was the chair of the State House Preservation Committee, which was the old name for what is today the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House. And that committee became the key committee that advocated for a curator, which was the number one recommendation. There should be a curator, there should be a friends organization, that allows for private investment in the state house, and the state house should be restored. Those three things. The, the legislature agreed with it, but behind the scenes, the sergeant at arms was sabotaging the curator provision. So it took another six years before my job was actually established. And um, that was the, you know, that was the environment. The State House had been kind of badly, um, badly renovated in the early 70s, and the 70s was all over the building. So we needed to purge the State House of the 70s, bring it back to its 19th century glory. And um, that took 20 years, frankly, working with this committee. Little and the, the friends group raised the first big chunks of money privately to make to show people what those rooms could look like. And we talked about the governor's office, which is where that started. And that's where we're going to be revisiting the carpet, the drapes, the things that are ephemeral that have now worn out, frankly, are looking a little sorry. And how do we keep that cycle? going that ensures that we never lose the, the glorious interiors that we gained through the restoration process. So that friends group, once they helped restore the state house, is now my right hand for helping us with the further mission of what a museum is all about, education. And so educating the public in various ways and the audience, the, the diverse audiences for the State House um, by, you know, they paid for this book. This was not a state publication. I wrote the book with Nancy Graff, one of Vermont's best historians. And this is the story of the State House and the story of the restoration of the State House. And it's now widely available uh, here. Uh, if you don't have a copy, I'm actually going to leave this copy in this room as your, um, your room copy of <clears throat> intimate grandeur. So go ahead and send that around. And I thought I'd bring a smattering of our brochures because this is the audience. We're, we're, we're reaching out to people in different ways with the Capital District, meaning all of the galleries in the Capital District, not just the State House, but including the Sculpture Garden at the Arts Council and other ways of reaching out. And um, our audio tour, which uh, during the pandemic, 
was the best way to reach any visitors once they started coming back to the building last July. We couldn't do tours and we still can't do tours really. Um, but uh, the cell phones that people carry are the vehicle for um, an audio tour and it's that easy. So we were, never was I more grateful than, than we invested in that means of showing visitors the state house. But now we have the biggest challenge of them all. As I look ahead to leaving in a few years, and that biggest challenge is looking at the state house with fresh eyes. We are no different than any other museum in the country that has gone through a reckoning. And I am incredibly grateful that we get to look at the state house with a totally new lens by examining how it is that Vermont's increasingly diverse population ensures that they feel this building is theirs. And that is the mission of not only our changing collections policy, but our, an interpretive plan that my office is working on now and has been throughout the pandemic. We took the pandemic seriously and the uh, interpretive plan, if, let me, let me explain how this bill works in terms of that. It's been in the works. It needs a little more time, but we will be finished by July of this year. We will have a draft interpretive plan in the hands of the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House. Now, the original bill that was proposed in the Senate had the committee changing to a State House Oversight Committee. Mm -hmm. And all, all of us were a little uneasy about that. Um, so it's still an advisory committee, but the language that you and others were kind of asking about, clarifying who approves or who develops is the way I think it should be. And that is that the onus is on my office to develop a, <coughs> an interpretive plan, to develop a collections policy, not on the committee itself. Um, because the reality is my office manages the collection. My office would be the one that would be most concerned about audiences and how we address those diverse audiences. So the, I think this bill has the right language to ensure that the state curator is responsible for most of this, not the committee itself. However, they are the, the, the place to go for approval of anything regarding the collections of anything regarding um, a disagreement that certainly could ha still happen between the Sergeant at Arms and the state curator. These things are gonna still happen. There's always tension between security of the state house and how the historic integrity is going to be preserved. There will all uh, tension exist, if you can imagine, between me and the IT staff. <laughs> I'm not super crazy about these things all over the building, but we're in a pandemic and I'm among, I am assume that you're as amazed as I am that things like this can still allow you to operate in a pandemic, in a global pandemic. So it's all about making compromises with what allows the state house to function successfully and how do we hang on to the beautifully um, created historic interiors that still allow the state house to read to those audiences as the great 
uh, intimate <laughs> and yet grand building that it was intended to be when it was built and still is today. And that, those, that's the hard work. And I think you're all asking the right questions. Who has responsible for what? And yet I, I like the language in here because it does make it clearer that we each need, are accountable to the Legislative Advisory Committee. And it isn't just a legislative committee, right? It has the three members in each body, um, but it also has the director of the Arts Council, the director of the Historical Society. Those people have always been on the committee um, since it was the State House Preservation Committee because they're the ones who were most concerned about what had happened to the State House in the 70s and how they wanted to try to get it back. So David, just to follow up a little bit, in, the MOU is not yet written, so I'm not imagining you can really answer this, but there is probably a role for the friends of the State House in the commissioning of new work or helping to, if that's one of the things that that uh, will be, you know, in the, within the scope of that group. Is that correct? I mean, it's, that is correct. Okay. And they are, they don't want to be responsible for restoring the State House all over again. So there are lines, I think we've had conversations in this committee in the past, can the friends pay for this, can the friends pay for that. I think we have to be careful that the people of Vermont are ultimately responsible for the most important things that maintain this building that belongs to everybody in Vermont, not just a few people, this building more than any other building in Vermont belongs to the people of Vermont. So going forward, the friends don't wanna be responsible for maintaining it, but they would be responsible certainly for enhancing it, particularly for visitors. And that relationship, knowing where they should be responsible. For example, we're hopefully when we're allowed to have events at the State House again, we're going to be scheduling the unveiling of the portrait of Alexander Twilight, which is going to be in the main lobby. We're looking forward to that. That, that is paid for entirely by the friends. And they did that at my request. So we have a couple more questions. Kurt, you have your hand up? Yes. Kurt, Michelle, and Marsha. Um, this this might be covered by the question that Sarah just asked, but um, you have a, a subcommittee developing a collections policy mm -hmm. and an MOU that's mm -hmm. doing oversight of the collection. Let's say I'm trying to envision a situation where this might come into play and a, a new curator is hired and he's a Maplethorpe fanatic and really likes <laughs> portraits of that elk or something and says, yes, this fits into my diversity policy. I want, I'm going to put this portrait in the entryway. Who then says, wait a minute, that's too controversial. We don't want it. And who is in charge? Would that be in the MOU with the oversight of the, would be developed so that the actual pieces of art would be vetted by more than just one person? Yeah. Here's the thing. I think the Legislative Advisory Committee does have approval of things that would be in particular a permanent uh, fixture in the collection itself. So the Maplethorpe uh, suggestion, which might actually bring me out of retirement, <laughs> and I would cause a coup d'etat to occur and uh, the curator would be gone and we'd start over. Again. Well, that, no, that's a <laughs> but, <laughs> that's, I mean, that's my question. So no, you're, you're totally right. Who's in the driver's seat? <laughs> who's right? in the driver's seat? And, and uh, Sarah is quite correct. The collection policies themselves, by their nature, tend to be the what's different about what we're creating right now as part of the interpretive plan is a collections policy that will be conservative 
And the conservatism is because we don't have all the money in the world to take care of everything. We don't have unlimited resources. We don't have um, uh, all kinds of things that one thinks of in maintaining a collection. So you want to be, and we don't, and we have a building that's already full of things. So we also have to recognize the collection that, that exists is one that we still have to maintain, even if it isn't deployed uh, fully throughout the building. So storage, you have to consider all of these things as ancillary to a collection policy. But that collections policy in its conservatism would also allow the committee itself to second guess, I think, a decision that was somewhat controversial. And that in, that in that setting and with the authorities at the table, in other words, not just legislators, um, but um, the uh, director of the Vermont Historic Society, the director of the Vermont Arts Council, these are people who, quite frankly, I would consider to be expert in certain uh, areas. And that's, that's what would be the debate. Right, and it may be a work of art. We're not going to, uh, you know, Maplethorpe is really old at this point, <laughs> so it's almost like right. Um, the challenges of the future are who knows what, right? But um, but this would be this would be in the policy or rather than the MOU. Yeah, the policy would give the curator as the first filter the opportunity to inform a potential uh, you know, proposal that they didn't think this was appropriate for the state house. And it wouldn't go to the committee unless um, that curator was convinced this was in the best interest of the state house and its collections. So in the one thing about the collection policy that is the reason we're doing it the way we are is you start with the interpretive plan and the collections policy is a, a tool to build that interpretive plan so anything that does not fit into that plan of interpretation is probably not appropriate for the state house but okay. what if, and to follow up a little bit on her, what if the advisory committee doesn't support the interpretive plan with a subcommittee? Then you're the saying curator the would change it. You're saying the collections policy right. builds on that interpretive plan. Right. So it's the a curator would have a problem if the committee did not agree. Yeah, I mean, you've got, words, the, you've got the subcommittee of right. the advisory committee that is going to uh, develop a collections policy that is based on the interpretive plan. So if that subcommittee doesn't support that interpretive plan, then what happens? Because that subcommittee will develop a collections policy that then goes to the larger advisory committee for their approval. That's the way the language is structured. Yes. Um, I would say that even a hint that the curator is interpretive plan or collections policies were in trouble with certain members of the committee would would not be a good thing. In other words, um, we talked in the in the Senate about whether this should be an advisory committee or whether it should be the ultimate authority. And we were more comfortable leaving the particularly talking to um, to um, I'm sorry, Becky, Becky um, about the difference between an advisory committee and the <clears throat> oversight committee, for example. Um, we were convinced that, frankly, the way uh, people operate, the any advisory committee is listened to and, frankly, has been giving approval all along. Our current collection policy was adopted by the Legislative Advisory Committee on the State House long ago. So, and it's a very conservative document that basically was what Sarah suggested 
our ability to say no to lots of things is enhanced in the current collection policy. The new one is what I would call more of an aspirational collections policy that is attempting to address the vibes of an old 19th century building that has a preponderance of old white men on the walls um, and attempting to address the subliminal messages yeah, as, as, in, as important as those men might have been as former governors or military leaders. Those are the two categories of the vast majority of our portraits. Um, as important as they are, is that the message that the State House should be conveying to every Vermonter? And we resoundingly say no. But how to address that and still allow the State House to read the way it needs to read as a grand building is a little tricky. And getting there will take time and money. Uh, to um, achieve these things. But the, so the, the great thing is we will have a plan. How to fulfill that plan, it will be broad language that allows for different ideas to fit under themes that we are identifying. And those themes are about democracy, about what this building is all about and always has been. Um, and how to how to do that in the 21st century so that uh, women in particular, but also um, other groups feel this is their building just as much as anybody else. So I'm going to push this along. So we've got two more questions. Ma'am will we'll be on the floor. You done, Kurt? Uh, for now. For I mean, now, yeah, uh, we've got some work yeah. to do. And Michelle and then Marsha. Okay, so I'll be quick. And this is really just building on what you were just saying. Mm -hmm. um, I think this bill is really important. Thanks to all of you who worked on it. Um, and as a, a teacher of history, who's been teaching history to Vermont youth for many years, I know very well that what we choose to share from our past impacts our present and it impacts our future. And when I walk into this building with my granddaughter, she sees a lot of old white guys on the wall and whether they were great white guys or not, that's all she sees. Mm -hmm. And in terms of our future and in terms of our present, there are more amazing people that we need to have reflected in our spaces. And I'm so happy to see us moving in this direction. So yeah. thank you. Absolutely. I, I will leave these as well. These are the print-offs that we used in the past year uh, so that people, frankly, from Janet's perspective, were not lingering in the building too long. Um, so this is our Abenaki exhibit downstairs. This is the women in the state house exhibit. Um, and the, the lobby is a good example of what I hope the entire building will eventually be evolving toward. So okay. Marcia? No, no, sir. so the bill has two, two different tracks. <clears throat> One is really figuring out the collection policy and, and the policy of the arts, art displays in the building. Mm -hmm. That's the first piece. The other part is not really connected to it, but sort of in a very thin thread, is the powers and duties, responsibilities of the Sergeant at Arms and the curator's office. So there's two separate things in the building. Mm -hmm. And my concern is that MOU is not connected to either one. The MOU is under the statute that sets up the advisory committee, but it is not referenced in the powers and duties of the curator or the sergeant at arms, and it's in a different statute. So okay. that's a concern. And Karen brought up about the MOU and how that ties in with the curator's and sergeant at arms powers and duties, but there's no reference. Mm -hmm. And where the MOU language is, is in a different title. It's in Title II, and that's connected with the advisory committee, where your powers and duties are in Title 29, so it can get lost. Gotcha. So that's a concern okay. there in terms of the structure. Well, we've got two different topics here that we're dealing in this bill, so I just sure. want the committee to be aware of that. We need to be on the floor. We have a joint session at 1030.
uh, for the election and retention of our judges, of our judges. So we do need to get to the floor. So folks on YouTube, we are done. We should be back here for the committee. Please come back after the vote tallies have been announced. It should be probably about 11.30, quarter of the 